uh, background. But today we have uh, a licensed FCC radio operator and instructor, uh, Brenda Brown. She's been a uh, volunteer and a facilitator at Make Haven and has been um, very willing to share her knowledge uh, about radio. I know she leads several groups uh, or helps to uh, facilitate conversations online via radio using things called uh, nets. I'm sure she'll get into that in more detail. Hi, I'm Brenda, KW1YL, and this is an introduction to radio. Specifically, it is an introduction to licensed radio operation, not for broadcasting, but for transmitting and receiving signals with other licensed radio operators. It's a great learning experience and a great hobby. If you wonder what we radio operators do and whether or not you would like to get a radio license, this is the class for you. There will be time at the end for questions and comments. Please hold your questions and comments until that time or type your questions in the chat room and I'll answer them at the end. <clears throat> Here's the program for the class. First, I'll give you a brief overview of what amateur radio is, and then tell you the advantages of getting a radio license. Then we'll talk a little about radio transmissions and how Earth and space weather can affect the transmissions. Then I'll show you some examples of radios with pictures. And then I'll tell you about all the fun that radio operators have with our groups and social gatherings and events. And then we'll get serious and I'll show you examples of study materials and a list of topics that you would need to study to pass the FCC exam. And I'll give you some examples of test questions. And then at the end, there will be a question and answer session. So, right away, you might be wondering why I put a bunch of letters after my name, KW1YL. What is that? KW1YL is my call sign. I am an FCC licensed radio operator, and all FCC licensed radio operators have a unique call sign. There are many Brendas. And if you add my last name, Brown, there are many Brenda Browns. But there is only one KW1YL FCC licensed radio operator in the whole world. So I have a call sign. So what? Amateur radio licensing began in the United States in mid December of 1912. The first licenses were granted by the Department of Commerce and then by the Federal Radio Commission and then in 1934 by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, which still grants licenses today. Requirements have changed and developed over the years. Now there are three classes of amateur radio license, technician, general, and extra. And I'm proud to have earned the highest level, which is extra. And here's an example of a radio license, my license. And it lasts 10 years, expires in 2028. FCC licensed radio operators are also known as amateur radio operators or hams. The word amateur means that we are not commercial, we do not do it for pay, and we do not broadcast to the general public. We transmit and receive signals to and from each other. 
not like your AM and FM commercial radio station, which broadcasts one way to the public, and we don't sell anything on the air except for ham-related equipment. Some of the most technically intelligent people in the world are amateur radio operators. Since around 1920, FCC licensed radio operators started calling themselves hams, which is a fun term for the way we like to ham it up when we get in front of a live microphone. To be more accurate and more descriptive, we are FCC licensed radio operators. So, why should you become an FCC licensed radio operator? For one thing, it will expand your understanding of physics, electronics, and nature as you learn about the propagation of electromagnetic radio waves. A lot depends on Earth weather conditions and also what is happening on the sun, which is space weather. For example, solar winds interfere with the ability of the Earth's upper atmosphere to reflect radio waves back down to Earth. But sunspots increase that same ability. So for radio operators, solar winds are bad and sunspots are good. Every 11 years or so, the sun's magnetic poles reverse, causing a peak in sunspot activity. That makes it really great for shortwave radio communications all around planet Earth. The sun's 11 year solar cycle, number 24, is ending right about now with a minimum of sunspot activity. And solar cycle number 25 may have already begun with the hope of new sunspot activity starting soon and peaking in about 2025. The more sunspots, the better for sending low power radio signals easily all around the world. There's a great space weather reporter called Space Weather Woman, who we rely on to tell us all about the current solar cycle and the presence of sunspots and solar storms. Here she is. Her name is Dr. Tamitha Scove. She has a PhD in planetary physics from UCLA, and she's a research scientist with the Space Materials Laboratory of the Aerospace Corporation in Los Angeles. She's an instructor at the Aerospace Institute, and she is an FCC licensed radio operator, WX6SWW. There are other space weather reporters, but she is one that my husband and I both like. She tells us how all these factors affect radio communications. Solar storm conditions, aurora five-day outlook, solar flare, and particle radiation storm five-day outlook. Front side sun, partial far side sun, impact time of a solar storm, moon phases. You can find her on YouTube and she has also been in a lot of magazine articles and TV shows, Popular Science, The History Channel, and lots more. Space Weather Woman. Another advantage of being a radio operator is that you can increase your technical expertise as you learn about the operation of radios and radio equipment. And you can start with a little radio like this. Here's my radio, it's my antenna, and here's the radio. It's on the kitchen table. It's called a Baofeng HT. And here is a close-up of one. HT stands for Handy 
walkie-talkie, as well as handheld transceiver. But everyone just says HT. You can get one of these for around $25, sometimes even for $20. Or if you want more options and bands and other capabilities, you can pay up to $60. With this radio, if the weather conditions are just right, you can send signals directly to radio operators with HTs up to six miles away. Typically, you'll get two to four miles, depending on weather and what obstacles are in the path of the signal. That is called simplex operation, one radio to another. You can also send signals from here in New Haven, all over Connecticut and Long Island Sound if you send them through something like called a repeater. A repeater is a powerful radio transceiver that tran retransmits your signal and sends it further. Repeaters are usually on mountains or at least hills because the higher up the antenna, the clearer the signal path and the further it travels. <laughs> We really, we usually send our signals to a repeater located on West Rock in Woodbridge. The repeater amplifies the signal and retransmits it on a different frequency. With a more powerful radio and a long wire antenna, you can transmit and receive signals at greater distances. With a good antenna, and optimal weather conditions, you can actually go all over the world with a radio like this. This is my base station radio, a Yezu FT991A, located on the kitchen table. And here's a close up of one. This radio can also be installed in a car or a camper. It's around $1,200 new now and $1,000 used. So you've seen some examples of radios. These are the radios that I use. There are many other brands of HTs and base station radios. I'm not affiliated with the brands that I showed you in any way. Yes, there are radios that you can operate without passing a test, and we do teach you about those in another course. They are great for neighborhood watch and family communications for about a one mile radius. But with an FCC license, FCC ham radio license, the entire world is your oyster. There are over 750,000 amateur radio operators in the United States. Thus, if you get a radio license, you instantly have joined a community of 750,000 hams. There are over 7,500 licensed radio operators in Connecticut. And there are 92 licensed radio operators in New Haven, Connecticut. And there are at least eight licensed radio operators at Make Haven. Here are the hams who are current Make Haven members. There might be more, but these are the ones that have come to my attention and I signed off on four of their licenses. Hams tend to know each other. We know each other's call signs on the air and we organize ourselves into various clubs and groups. I am currently active in four local radio groups. This shirt is from one of them, 
the Milford Amateur Radio Association, um, Milford Amateur Radio Repeater Association, Mara, um, at one of them. And there might be more. Uh, let's see, uh, where was I? Uh, sorry. I am also in the Shore Point Amateur Radio Club Spark and the Amateur Radio Club at Yale, W1YU. And I'm also secretary treasurer of the Veterans Amateur Radio Group FARG, KW1VA, which was formed to support the Connecticut Veterans Administration's Emergency Operations Center. The reason I chose to join so many groups is that each group has something unique to offer. So I participate in breakfast gatherings, flea markets, training sessions, licensing sessions, and regular radio nets. A net is simply when one radio operator, known as a net control, calls for other hams to check in on the radio with their call signs and gives them each a turn to speak. I'm a net control for two radio nets for the Spark Club, including one that they call Brenda's Breakfast Net. We also have field day, when we can test our ability to make contacts from the great outdoors. It is practice for emergencies operating without commercial power. And it's also a contest to see who makes the most contacts. This picture is me with the cap and another radio operator, Mary Duval, K1MTD, on field day on top of Avon Mountain, making contacts. Members of these radio groups also assist with crowd control at walkathons for worthy causes, or at football games, fire engine busters, and parades. We also have festivals. Here's Hams having fun at a festival called Nearfest in New Hampshire, where we camp out and have workshops and other events for two nights and two days. This is a ham band, a little play on words, because the frequencies on the radio that Hams use are called ham bands. We have applied for a Make Haven radio station license and hope to get the NH1MH call sign, New Haven 1 Make Haven. There is a national radio group called Amateur Radio Relay League, or ARRL founded in 1914, and a national group for emergency services called Amateur Radio Emergency Service, or ARIES, established by ARRL in 1935. In this picture, you see the circle showing Amateur Radio Emergency Service, and in the middle, a symbol showing ARRL. I'm a member of both ARRL and ARIES, and I've had some training on assisting in emergency operations. ARIES also sponsors a spotter service called Skywarn, which consists of trained weather spotters who monitor storms in the local area. When bad weather approaches, ARIES members report by radio to the emergency coordinator for Skywarn for their region. There is a training course that must be passed for a leadership role in ARIES, which operates under a chain of command system. ARIES has national, state, and regional divisions. Make Haven has a video on YouTube from a class presented by Douglas. W-A-1-S-F-H, the Emergency Coordinator for Connecticut Aries Region 2, which includes New Haven. 
if you want to learn more about ARIES, search Make Haven, then Amateur Radio Emergency Service, and you can view the YouTube video on YouTube. When all else fails and the hurricanes come, the tornadoes strike, the cell towers go down, and the electricity goes off. FCC licensed radio operators can continue to communicate and facilitate emergency services. There is more to radio life than I can possibly describe, but one more that is important is that we can become qualified to administer FCC exams. I have that qualification and I have administered many exams and signed off on licenses for those who pass the exam. Amateur radio operators are all ages and genders. A girl named Veronica Harrington KC6TQR was granted a tech license in 1991 at the age of five and a half. That's really unusual, but there are many young operators. There is an annual event called Jamboree on the Air every October for scouts and guides formerly known as Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and Girl Guides. And Scouts and Guides encourage their members to get licenses. The population of amateur radio operators is mostly men, but 15, not 50, but 15% of us hams in the United States are women. Male radio operators are traditionally called OMs, which stands for old man. And female radio operators are traditionally called YLs, which stands for young lady, since old lady sounded too negative when applied to women. Most radio groups are for all licensed hams, but there are some groups that are exclusively for why else, so that we aren't always overshadowed by the men. I participate in some women's nets and social media groups that are designated YL only, and many mixed nets and groups. There is a computer application called Echolink, available only to licensed radio operators, that allows us to talk with radio operators all over the world, via the computer or smartphone. I participate in a net for YLs on Echolink that includes women from all over the United States and some across the pond in the UK. So, what do you have to do to become an amateur radio operator? The first step is to study for the FCC exam for the first level technician. There's a book, the ARRL Ham Radio Licensed Manual. It costs $30 or $33 for a nice spiral bound copy like this one. You can order one from ARRL in Newington, Connecticut. Or if you are local, you can buy one at Make Haven and save on shipping. Everything you need to know to pass the exam is in this one book. So, what's in the book? There's an introductory chapter and some handy charts, but basically it's just eight chapters, chapters two through nine, that cover eight basic categories of topics then there's a glossary and a question pool. And here's the breakout of that content with subchapters. The welcome, and then chapter two, the first chapter to study. Electricity, 
uh, radio and signal fundamentals. You learn how the radio works and what is a radio signal. Then chapter three, you have electricity, components, and circuits. This is basic elementary electronics that applies to all electronics, not just radio. So it's a breeze for anyone already versed in electronics. If you're not versed in electronics, don't worry. Middle school and high school students are learning these basics. And it's good general knowledge that you might also be able to apply in areas other than radio. Chapter four is propagation, antennas, and feed lines. That section is particular to radio. You learn about how signals travel between the radio and the antenna and into the airwaves and what affects the signals as they travel through the airwaves. Chapter five is amateur radio equipment. Once you know the basics of what must be accomplished, you can understand the types of equipment required to do it. Chapter six is communicating with other hams. There are protocols for your behavior on the air so that communications go smoothly and without disruption. You basically learn good manners as they apply to radio. Chapters seven and eight are licensing and operating regulations. There are rules about what you can and cannot do on the airwaves. I found these sections a breeze, but people who already know a lot about electronics and physics and Ohm's law and have a lot of technical general knowledge find the rules and regulations the hardest part as it is specific to radio and relatively more tedious than learning about antennas, something new to learn. I was an English major, so I found the other parts harder but none of it is beyond the ability of an average person who is willing to prepare for the 35 question exam. Last, but definitely not least, chapter nine is safety. As long as you follow the basic safety advice found in this chapter, amateur radio is basically a safe activity, but there is a chance of radio frequency burns if you don't follow the instructions. I've never met Mr. R.F. Burns, as they say, if you get a radio frequently burned. But some new hams jump ahead and mess around with hot wires and the like without taking simple precautions, and they do meet Mr. R.F. Burns. I have been told that meeting Mr. R.F. Burns feels like you are touching something hot, even though it's not hot. It's not that big a deal, although it can be momentarily uncomfortable. The answers to all 423 questions in the question pool are in the last chapter, chapter 11, in the back of the book. There will be 35 multiple choice questions on the test that you take, randomly selected from the question pool. All you need to do is answer 26 out of the 35 correctly, which is 74%. One question from each of the 35 topic groups is selected. Multiple choice, A, B, C, and D. Usually two of the answers are obviously wrong, so between the other two, you can usually reason out or recognize the correct answer if you've studied. There's an app that you can put on your phone to take practice exams over and over. When you take a practice exam, the app grades it and lets you know the correct answer to the questions you missed and leads you back to the page in the ARRL license manual that addresses that question so you can study the areas you are weak in. I found this app very useful when studying for my license and there are corresponding apps for the higher classes of license that I use when preparing for my two advanced licenses. Here's the table of contents 
for the app on my phone. First, there's the review question pool that simply gives you all the questions and four choices and shows you the correct answer. Then there's the practice question pool that gives you the questions and choices and lets you pick the correct answer. And then it tells you if you're right or wrong. Then there's a section of all the FCC rules and regulations that apply to amateur radio, which will always be a handy reference even long after you have passed your exam. Then there are practice tests. You take a test, it grades you, and gives you back your answers and the correct answers and saves it all in the next session, which is the test history. And you have settings with various options, like if you want it automatically to go to the next question or wait until you tell it to advance and things like that. And here is a sample question. The question is, what is component four in figure T3? A, antenna, B, transmitter, C, dummy load, and D, ground. And over here on the left is figure T3. Looking at this figure, you see that component four is higher up than all of the other components. And antennas are supposed to be high. So let's try choosing A, antenna. It lights up in green. And it tells you that A is correct. Now, what if we instead were to choose the silliest answer? Let's choose D, ground. It lights up in red. You, D is wrong. You may notice the question number is shown on the bottom. That's so you can refer back to the page in the manual that addresses that very question. So the app is called ARRL Technician Exam Prep and listed under Ham Test Prep for both iOS and Android. The one on my iPhone costs $4.99. If you wish to pursue this and become an FCC licensed radio operator, let me know. For Makehaven members, I am on Slack. If you are not on Makehaven Slack, you can email info at makehaven.org and ask to be put in touch with the radio people. I'm one of them and my husband, Rich, K1RSU, is another. We can start you on your way, set up an exam session, and give you your exam. If you take the exam and you get just 26 of the 35 questions right, you will pass the exam and you too will be, receive a bunch of letters after your name, your own call sign. It will be sequentially assigned by the FCC, but you may then choose to apply to the FCC for a call sign of your choice, as long as it is in the proper format and it doesn't belong to any other radio operator. You will become an FCC licensed radio operator and enter the world of radio. And that's it for my introduction to radio. Now it's time for Q&A and comments. Rich k rsu will select some questions from the chat for me to answer. And you can continue to type in questions or ask to speak. This is KW1YL over to K1RSU. Okay. Uh, everybody can hear me. Um, 
I'm getting some feedback. So please, everybody have your microphones silenced and we'll take turns. So there was uh, not, there's a lot of comments, Brenda. Uh, not a lot of questions, but uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Julia says, definitely zombie prep. So when the great catastrophe comes, we'll be able to fight the war against the zombies. <laughs> okay. They, uh, let's see. Um, and how do hams help in emergency situations? Well, if they belong to Aries, uh, they can uh, participate in uh, services that report information where resources are located and they can help you contact somebody that you would not be able to otherwise contact because your phones are down and the internet is down so they can communicate radio to radio off of battery power. Uh, hope that helps. Um, uh, you have a cochlear implant. Will I be able to do this? Yeah, just if you notice Brenda right now, she's wearing a set of headphones and uh, you can put headphones on and uh, pump the sound right into both ears. Um, so I, I think that'll work for you. Uh, what are some limitation differences between handheld and tabletop? Uh, handheld, handheld are lower power. They operate on a set of batteries. Uh, tabletop radios plug in the wall and or they operate off of a car battery, 12 volt car battery. Um, so let me see. Um, I think that pretty much, hope I didn't miss anything. Let me scroll up and see. Uh, yeah, if you, Reed wants to uh, reach out and connect with more people who are interested in radio, well, you come to the right place, Reed. It's a good place to get started and um, uh, get the book, study it. It's actually, it's a really good read. Uh, and then take the exam. And when you want to take the exam, contact us and we'll help you um, take the test. Okay, let's see. Um, I see anything else here. Okay, so Brenda is my uh, dearly beloved. And Brenda, I'm wondering if uh, you could show them the last slide of the radio bench at Makehaven. Okay, can, um, wait a minute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, I would like to answer some of the questions. Well, they're all, there's no more questions. I know, that's the problem. <laughs> I was going to answer them. <laughs> but anyway, okay. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Did I steal? <laughs> so there is a question. How are uh, repeaters operated, powered, and otherwise? Uh, and Molly wants to ask a voice question when she gets a chance. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Molly, I would like you to ask your question. Oh, hi. Thanks for... Um, thank you. So I had asked what uh, like some of the limitations or differences between the handheld and the tabletop radio, but I, I specifically meant in terms of like capacity for communication. So I've tried ham radio before, but always with other setups. Um, and so I'm just trying to imagine like when I have a vision for a setup, I can only really base it on what I've done. And they've just been these like totally uh, like rigged out people that have this incredible setup. So if I wanted to uh, communicate with people internationally, um, am I sort of imagining that I would have to have a particularly expensive and detailed one versus the handheld would really um, not limit me, but I would just be in touch with people more locally. So, cause you would said that there was a difference between the say like the $2,000 and the $20. So I imagine that there's just like a, a vast differences, but, um, just could you maybe like describe the the spectrum within that? Thank you. Um, I'm not, that was a really long question. <laughs> I got kind of lost in in what you're asking. The differences between the handheld and the desk is basically the the amount of power that that it has. Um, and then effectively, how far does it reach? Right, how far it reaches, yeah. And the handheld uh, basically just usually 
uh, we can actually use those in the car for a couple of miles when we both have the handheld uh, radios in our cars um, and we can talk to each other a couple of miles away um, and I understand it can go four or six miles if everything is just right. It can go that far. But basically, um, because of the fact that you need a really good antenna, it's mostly the antenna that matters. Wow. And in, you can't have, and, and you have to have a really good antenna to go far. The longer the antenna, the farther it goes, basically. And so the one that I have on my kitchen table, the, the desk, the base station radio, basically, the big radio, we have it connected to an antenna on our roof, which is able to go way further than I can just go with the little antenna that I showed you on my handheld receiver. But I can also connect my handheld receiver to the antenna on the roof, and then it goes further. So, you know, it's it has to do with the antenna, and it also has to do with the power of the radio. Both those things are part of it. Can, can the old man join in for a second? Sure, you can. I just <laughs> wanted to be able to say something. <laughs> okay. So the, the radios that you hold in your hand are operated on the battery. There's a limited amount of power in that battery. And they operate on higher frequencies, which allow shorter antennas. So they don't go as far. But there is one exception. There is a handheld radio that you can put in your hand, and it's called Digital Mobile Radio, DMR. And it talks to a repeater. And from there, it goes all over the internet to repeaters all over the world. And you can talk with this low power handheld digital radio to people in other countries. Now, the little radio that Brenda showed you earlier, that Baofeng HT, um, I've seen her talk to people in Great Britain on uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, they link all the repeaters together, and with her little four watts of uh, signal through the repeater, she was able to talk to someone in uh, the UK. So it, there's a lot to it. Now, the, the base station radio, she showed you a picture of the one that's on the kitchen table. That thing is capable of putting out 100 watts on the low bands, which need a longer antenna. And they're the, they're the bands, the radio frequencies that are most likely to go long distance around the world. And you could pick one of those up. If you bought it new, maybe 1200 bucks, used around 1000 And there's a number of other companies who make radios similar to that. Um, yeah, you can go all the way up to three, 4000 if you want to spend that kind of money. So I don't know. I hope that answered your question. And I'll shut up now. And I hate to lord it over the YLs. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, yes, that was an example. <laughs> so Brenda, one can't, question from Reed was, uh, do you have monthly meetings? Uh, he has his license, and this has been informative, um, even for someone who just passed your license. So do you have monthly meetings? Oh, with the radio groups, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like the nets are pretty much your, your regular meeting, right? Is that? Well, actually, we also have meetings or before COVID, we had meetings, all the groups had actual meetings in person, not necessarily monthly. There are um, a couple of groups that have monthly meetings, but there's one that has one every six months, you know, they're different. But yeah, the groups do have meetings in person as well as the nets. And the nets are a lot of times weekly meetings. Old man joined in. <laughs> okay, old man. <laughs> well, JR said, you know, there are online nets. Like, for instance, the one in Woodbridge, uh, W1WPD, that is a, a repeater, and you can get to it with a low power handheld radio. And if you just listen to that repeater, there's half a dozen nets every week there of various groups getting together and talking to each other. And in a given day, the repeater is mostly quiet, but first thing in the morning, it's very busy 
with people going to work. And then there's a rag chews in the middle of the day. And that night is when the big nets join in, like the Yale net or like the Skywarn net or the Aries net or the Spark net. And these are the places where, you know, it's kind of like virtual meetings with your radio. I hope that answers the question. And thanks for mentioning it, Jer. Back to KW1YL. This is K1RSU. Okay. Um, well, um, I have two questions. I have one I just saw. And also, um, now, I, I want to go back to that question about the, the cochlear implant. Um, well, I can, because I'm right now, um, you know, I'm using these um, phones, I can hear really well, but I have uh, a hearing problem myself, and uh, um, I'm still able to hear on the radio just as well as I can hear other things with my hearing aids. Um, so, uh, so I haven't really had any, any problems. Uh, hearing any differently than I do with my hearing aids. I don't hear better <laughs> unless I have these earphones in, but I don't hear any worse on the radio. So I guess maybe that answers that. I don't know. And then I have a question with the most memorable experience that I've had on the radio. And the only thing that comes to mind is that I didn't really say that much about that fire muster that I mentioned, that sometimes that we are involved in fire musters, fire engine musters. And the uh, in Milford, they have annually all the fire engines from all around. They come and they, they have a big parade. And, and the radio operators are asked to participate in that. And we participated in that. And I got to ride in the fire truck. And what we do is we report to the control people where the fire engines are. They're, they're approaching, they're starting at their starting point and they're approaching different parts along the route. And then we report where they are along the route and so that everything goes smoothly with this fire muster. So I thought that was just real fun riding on the fire truck and being involved in that fire muster. That I got to I got to pop in again on that. Oh, of course you do. Okay. So it's a big parade and all the fire engines and emergency vehicles are running their sirens. So it's really a trip to be in the fire engine as you're driving down. It's long. It's a long it's a, it's like a 45 minute ride. And there's people all alongside of the streets cheering and waving flags and everything. And to be on the back back end of the fire engine, uh, standing up and holding on for dear life with a radio in your hand, it was a trip. And it was really exciting. So I was there when Brenda was on. She was, were we on the same? You were on different, you were on a different one, right? No, I was on, I think the front and you were on the back or something like uh, that. Okay. Well, that's what how us old men are. We're always left on the back. All right, back to net control. Take it away. <laughs> KW1YL, this is K1RSU. Okay. Uh, well, uh, now, Rich, you had um, something. I don't think there's any other questions. Are there any other questions? Well, I had a, a question, which is just okay. something that I found interesting, which is about digital information. So I understand that there is a um, there are certain bands you can communicate digitally on, and that there's even a system, although you may not have used it, for sending email, uh, albeit very slowly, but without the internet, directly radio to radio, uh, wherever you want. Did you do you have any experience, or do you want to say anything about the digital modes that are available out there? Well, yes, there are a lot of digital modes, and no, I haven't really had the experience with those um, because partially because I don't have the right antenna to do a lot of things that I could otherwise do. But uh, I have had some training on the sending of of messages of uh, traffic, uh, so I have some training on that and practice in formulating 
it has to all be done with a certain formula. And so I have learned a little bit about that. But yes, that is an aspect of it, sending the messages. Can I pop in? Sure. <laughs> uh, you know how SOMs are. Well, you can hook a computer up to your, um, to your transceiver, to your transmitter and receiver. And instead of talking, uh, you can type a message. And the message has to have a certain format, and it'll go out over the air. And everybody else who is using that mode, that digital mode, will have a line of text appear on their screen. They will see everything you type. And they, in turn, can type a message back. And you could have a dozen people doing this, and you can have these constant lines of communication streaming across your computer screen, stacked up on top of each other. You can reply to anyone that you want, but that is that works really well. Uh, when it's set up right, um, it could be a very electrically noisy outdoor environment. Signals don't, uh, hard to talk with voice, but the data will punch right through and you will get the messages. And most of the emergency, uh, the serious emergency FEMA uh, traffic is done in that way, although they still do use voice point to point or through repeaters. So digital is a way to move text from your location to many locations at the same time. I, and there are different ways to do it. Sending it back to net control, take it away, KW1YL, this is K1RSU. Any other questions? Are there any questions? Okay, can you show um, that slide of the radio bench? Yeah, I'll present it again. When you're ready. Okay. Okay, let me talk here. Um, this is the top part of the radio bench at May Cave, and that is a, a special antenna. That's a pretty cool antenna, actually. It's called a disc cone. You can see the V section is shaped like a cone, and you can see the flat part up here. Those radials form like a disc, disc cone antenna. And this antenna is particularly good at receiving signals over a very wide band of frequencies. Brenda, can you scroll down a little bit? All right. <laughs> and this is this is Brenda in front of the bench, fully prepared. She's very uh, radioactive and prepared for uh, COVID. This we took this picture as a joke at one point, but it's one of my favorite pictures of her standing in front of the Make Haven radio bench, and um, gotta love her. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it back to Brenda. Um, take it away, uh, net control. This is uh, Brenda. Somebody asked if there's any good websites about radio for newbies. Uh, and then a few people are signing out and thanking you. And then somebody else wanted to be reminded how many, uh, licensed radio operators were in Connecticut and in the U S. Oh, okay. Well, that last question uh, in Connecticut is 7,500, 7,500, <laughs> I should say, 7,500 in Connecticut and 750,000 in the U.S. And now websites, what specifically were they asking about with the websites? What was the question? Just uh, websites that are good for newbies or maybe... Um I don't know if there's like a YouTube channel or video that's a good summary, any resources that they should follow. I know you promoted the book. Is there anything else that people should look into? Well, the best thing is just to get into the book because basically that's got everything that you need. I mean, I'm sure that you can find YouTube videos that'll say things about it like, like I'm doing, and I guess this will be on YouTube. But 
I think that if you really want to learn about radio, that you need to uh, get that book, the ARRL License Manual, and uh, um, and read it. Um, and I can't think of anything better to recommend, but I'm sure there are alternatives that you can look for. Yeah, let me jump in. There are a lot of uh, online radio amateur colleges, and uh, there's a bunch of old timers who offer classes one after another after another on little aspects of radio and um the i don't know how to get you to it by talking but there's two or three places you can go and get one lesson just look look up uh amateur radio college that'll get you started and then oh. you also you can go to the american radio relay league and they will have a whole bunch of links there that you can click on and find something that you like. Yeah, and and um, I just remembered. Um, in addition to that, yeah, amateur radio uh, college. There are these two guys that will talk about the different questions on the exam as part of their their little presentation. And I'm not sure exactly how to find them. I haven't found them in a while. But there are also two shows that you can stream. Um, one is, I think, on Tuesday nights. One might be Wednesday. I'm not sure. That are about radio. And um, I haven't watched them in so long. I'm trying to remember their names. Um, that... And you could also go to what they call a ham fest. And these ham fests last for either a whole day or multiple days. And they, they have many meeting rooms and a lot of classes going on in those meeting rooms. So you don't need to have a license to go there, but you can get and hear a lot of hams talking about various issues there. You can learn a lot there. So once you get your license, uh, you'll hear everybody talking about there are many ham fests around us here in New Haven. And how many how many ham radio operators are there in New Haven, Brenda? Ninety-two. Ninety-two. Okay. So Brenda and I are a couple of them. And I would say we have probably met most of them. And um, so anyway, signing off once again, turning it back over to net control. This is amateur radio talk, by the way. Uh, back to KW1YL, this is K1RSU. Have we answered everybody's questions? Is there any other questions? Not a question. I just wanted to say thank you, Brenda, for putting this together. It was fascinating. I had no idea there was so much to it. Oh, well, you're welcome. I'm so glad that you got something out of it. <laughs> uh, oh, I was trying to look up the names of those shows. I used to watch them all the time and, and it just simply flipped right out of my mind. But anyway, okay, well, it's now um, 7.33 and so maybe, um, <clears throat> Maybe we need to sign off, I guess. Um, so uh, in ham radio talk, when we say goodbye, we say seven three. <laughs> so seven three. Seven three, Brenda. Thanks for inviting me. Seven three. Thank you so much. 7-3, this is K1RSU, clear and listening. <laughs> Brenda, can you hear me? Uh, KW1YL, can you hear K1MTD? Uh, what was the question? Uh, this is Mary, just wondering if you can oh. hear her. <laughs> I don't think it worked. I, I can. I can hear you. 
You can hear me. This yeah. is my first time using Meet, and I'm not sure if I'm doing it right. But I want to thank you, Brenda, for inviting me to this. You did an excellent job. And uh, I'm a ham radio operator. I'm K1MTD in the picture that you showed. And uh, good luck to everyone who wants to become a ham radio operator. K1MTD, back to you. And thank you very much, Mary. I, was, I knew you were here. Uh, and I was just hoping that that was OK with the whole with that part, with that picture and, and what I said. So I'm just so glad that you're happy with it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, I'm glad you spoke. So let's see, uh, Mary and Rich and me, and there's just this one other person that's there that I can still see. <laughs> Hi, Joe. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Seven three. Seven three. Good night. <laughs> Joan Daigle, who's that? <laughs> okay, she doesn't dare say a word. Come on, Joan. <laughs> this is your cousin here. It's her. There's it's nobody her, else but Mary. It's, and... it's her fifteen minutes of fame. <laughs> <laughs> now she won't. Okay. There's a problem. I'm sorry. Can you oh, hear me? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a root. My my screen is frozen, and uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> I don't we know can, why it's all frozen, but I'm here. We can see you, okay. and we can hear you. Okay, I can't see myself, but that's all right. Well, there you are. There's a door yeah. in back of you. Yeah, I, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I was late, but I I was not late. I was early trying to connect and. For some reason, your sign-in page um, threw me to Google, which refused to recognize my account. So it took like 10 minutes for me to re-establish an account with Google before I could make the connection. So my apologies. I missed, I missed the very beginning of what you did. But. Wow. Well, you had the same experience that I had when I was trying to join a friend of mine's video on Zoom. I had that same uh, thing. I even had to join LinkedIn and Zoom and oh, wow. thing. And by the time I did all that, it was too late. They wouldn't let me in. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so at least yeah, you got I, in. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's funny because I have no problem with Zoom. You know, <laughs> Zoom is just very easy and automatic for me. But this one, whatever this, you know, whatever the platform is, um, it just didn't Google didn't like me being on it. So <laughs> they all they all take a little bit of getting used to and coming up the learning curve. Uh, Joan, well, it wasn't our, a learning curve. It was just that I automatically was diverted to Google, and Google said, "You don't your account information is invalid. You know, do you need me to?" So then it made me. You know, they they sent like three different messages to my text, texted me to my phone. Then they did it by email. They just kept. It just was a nightmare, and it was whatever the Google link was. It wasn't me. It wasn't a learning curve on my part. I was just following the directions. <laughs> what browser? What browser are you using? Safari. That's the problem. It's not you're a problem. To, you're, it is. It is for this. You need to use Chrome. Well, hello. Um, it's a, it'll work better if you use Chrome. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. Oh, I thought I told everybody problem. that, but maybe I failed to tell Joan. Oh my goodness. No, you didn't tell me anything. Oh, well, I, I said it in different posts, but I don't think I, I sent you an email. Okay, so, all right, sorry. Yeah, no, I never got any, if, no, I never got anything, so. Oh. I just, um, I just it, it went my usual way and whatever. I'm here. Okay, well. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> There's some other friends that didn't get in either. Maybe they had the same problem, I guess. They're not here anyway. <laughs> yeah, but, it's a lot easier if you use Chrome. I, I've been through the. Uh, I hate Chrome. I hate uh, Chrome with a passion. So unless I'm forced to, I won't use it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, no, I, I, you know, sorry. It's just not, I find- Hey, Brenda, you know, it runs in the family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to use one of the things I had to use for this. Yeah. It was, I had to use QuickTime instead of, instead of Chrome for, uh, you know, projecting. Yeah, so- so that my my letters wouldn't be backwards. 
Oh, right. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> well, they are when I see them in my face right now. Well, I'm going to say goodbye to you all, and uh, I'm going to drop out now. And um, Brenda, you did a great job. It was really fun. It really it was quite interesting. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad I was able to sit in on it. Yeah, if you missed the middle, the beginning, you can uh, go find it on YouTube. Give Jr. a couple days to get it ready and put it up on YouTube. But he hopefully... did a great job, by the way, of monitoring the questions. You, he, yeah, he really, he really was on top of that and made sure that everybody's questions actually got heard. He, he was really good. Yeah, he's much better at it than I am. He, he does many, many, many of these. This is. In the last uh, since COVID, he's must have done you know twenty five of them. So he also asked great questions. So he was a really good contributor. Yeah, I know. I really suck at that, but <laughs> no, I'm joking. All right, I'm out of here. All right. Well, I guess I'll go too. Okay. Well, it was good to see you both, and Mary. Good to see. You. <laughs> Who's still on is that too? me? <laughs> is that me? The green M. Brenda, is that me, the green M? No, that's Can you see me else. or just hear me? I, I can, can hear you, you and see you. And, I, yeah. oh, and it's okay. not the M, I actually can see your image. Oh, okay, because I don't see it. <laughs> I've, I've never used meet, this is the first time, but it's, it's pretty good. I just wasn't sure I was doing it right. Yeah, we see try, you. Try click. Talking. Try clicking on the M, Mary, and see if that lets you look at yourself. Nah, it doesn't want to let me look at myself. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> no matter. Hey, I saw I, everybody else, and that's what counts. Are you uh, sitting in your shack? I'm in my map. radio room. Yep, yep. <laughs> it's okay. kind of to the side of me, so you can't see it from uh, from here, but... Okay. okay, I see that. I see that map on the wall. It's typically yeah, you can fine. see that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you can see me. So I guess I'm doing yeah. it right. The last time Great I saw you was Brenda. on top of Avon Mountain. Do you, <laughs> when, yeah, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Did you do um, one Delta for Field Day this year? No. Did you? You didn't do it. Uh, there no. were a lot of one deltas out there because of COVID, and I think it was a good thing ARRL did that. But one one interesting thing is from the top of Avon Mountain with that Baofeng HT, I was able to uh, key up the Woodbridge repeater all the way down there in uh, New Haven from the top of Avon Mountain. So I was wow. able, to, yeah, well, just uh, just with that small HT on uh, well seventy centimeter, so it worked. Anyway, good to see you. I'm disconnecting. For good night, real. everybody. Seven three. Go and QRT.